Okay, so we saw that we have control over the complexity of our models by making choices with respect to the basis functions. For example, in the polynomial case, we could uh, decide to work with uh, higher order polynomials, let's say up to order nine, and this allows us to really fit very complex functions. But really uh, working with such a complex model also means that, uh, that it's quite prone to overfitting, and that's something that we want to avoid. Now, instead of manually setting or choosing the optimal order of your basis, for example, we're going to take a slightly different approach. We will talk about regularized least squares regression, where we include a regularization parameter. And this parameter, as we will see, puts some control over uh, on the model complexity. Okay, this is, so this is what we saw. We have control over the model complexity by, by changing the order. If I have a very low order, a model or a very simple basis, then I cannot produce very complex uh, functions. Now, if I increase the number of basis functions, uh, let's say to MS3, I have a more flexible model that now can nicely represent my data. And then if I go to a very high order, uh, let's say MS9, I have a very complex model that can fit all sorts of functions. Uh, so also this very noisy function, which goes precisely do to the data. But we should also remember that this MS9 case should also be capable of uh, fitting this MS3 case because the polynomials up to order x to the power 3 are also included in this set. So it would be possible with this kind of a base set to also fit these kind of functions. Now we saw that this, this isn't happening uh, because my MS9 model, for example, is really putting a lot of emphasis in pushing the error to zero. So it goes precisely to these data points. And in order to do so, uh, my weights has had to take on very large values. And this is something that we want to prevent. So we want to prevent large values because this basically implies overfitting. Okay, so with these observations in mind, let, let's just make a heuristic choice. Let's say instead of so instead of manually constraining the number of parameters for small data sets, and because overfitting occurs when I have little data and I can choose the number of parameters, the number of basis functions. So instead of manually choosing an optimal set of basis functions, let's just say I'm going to work with this high order model because it can represent a lot of functions. So also the nice ones. And I'm just going to add a penalty term, a penalty term that suppresses these large values. So that prevents uh, all these weights to, be, to, to take on these large values. So let's do that. So let's add an extra term. So lambda over to the sum over all my weights of wi squared. So I'm going to put a squared penalty on, on the weights because if my weights are very large, this means a large penalty. So I should, uh, by reducing w, I can reduce this error by quite a, quite, quite a bit. So introducing this extra penalty term will lead to uh, solutions that have low values for W because if they were large, then I would have a large error and well, uh, we are minimizing this thing. Now, this is something that people uh, quite often do as a regularization term, and this is called rich regression, where this thing is, uh, is called the rich penalty term. Now, in practice, this bias term is often not included in these regularization uh, penalties because uh, the role of the bias is precisely to allow for shifts in my predictions. Uh, so W0, uh, you want to have this option that this bias is different than zero to allow for the shift. Uh, but another reason is that this bias term doesn't really add to model complexity. It's just a straight line and it doesn't make my model more complex. So we have So we have that the bias is not included in regularization because its role is precisely to allow for offsets, but also it doesn't really add to model complexity. Now we've seen this type of error before, right? So we, we are minimizing here a sum of squared errors and we're putting a quadratic penalty on the weights. Now, where have we seen this thing before? Precisely, it was in the maximum a posteriori approach for um, estimating the parameters for W. So this is what we uh, what we just heuristically derived. So we said we're minimizing the sum of squared errors and we're just going to add this quadratic penalty to it and we're going to weight this 
penalty with some lambda parameter. So if lambda is very high, I put a lot of penalty on high weights, on large weights. And if it's zero, basically, then I'm back to my original uh, least squares regression problem. Now we saw the same uh, error actually arising in the, the map case, where we want to maximize the posterior distribution for the weights. So let's have a quick recap of, of what this looked like and how, this, uh, how we obtained this uh, regularized least squares problem in this setting. So we first know that we're optimizing or maximizing the, the posterior distribution for W given my data and some hyperparameter. Now this posterior was obtained via a base rule and base rule says that my posterior is obtained via the product of the likelihood of the data uh, being explained by my model, which is parameterized by a set of W, times the prior for my uh, weights uh, W. And this was then normalized uh, via the evidence for the data. Now remember that this prior encodes my prior belief of the weights taking on certain values. And often we take this prior belief to be normally distributed, so we say my model parameters w, I expect them to be close to zero, so my Gaussian distribution has a mean zero, and I allow it to deviate from zero with some uncertainty, that's my uh, precision parameter alpha. So alpha is a hyperparameter that describes the width of this distribution and basically says how certain I am that the weights will be close to zero. Okay, so let's write this out. We're maximizing uh, the posterior with respect to W and we might as well take the logarithm of it because it doesn't change uh, the location of this optimal value, but it does make our computations a lot easier. So we're actually minimizing the negative log of this uh, um, uh, posterior distribution. Now, uh, the rules of logarithm tell us that this product uh, splits into a sum. So actually we're minimizing uh, well, the negative likelihood and the negative uh, log prior. And this evidence doesn't depend on W, so it isn't part of this uh, minimization uh, uh, framework. Now, this likelihood so far, we always model to be uh, a normal distribution. Uh, so these normals are exponential, e to the power of minus, and then some uh, one over to the precision parameter, etc. Uh, so let's just write this out. So if I take the logarithm of this, I only take the part in this exponential. where we modeled uh, the mean of this uh, predictive distribution to be modeled with this, this, pro, this, this model uh, y, uh, which maps an x to a corresponding target value parameterized by a set of weights. So that was the type of models that we were deriving with this likelihood uh, optimization approach. And then we have a beta parameter which, which puts some uncertainty on my predictive distribution. And this beta relates to the uncertainty, my measurement noise basically. And now my prior is also uh, assumed to be normal, normally distributed. So it has this uh, front factor. Let's just write C e to the power minus precision over to uh, W transpose W uh, because my, my mean was zero. So this is what my prior looks like. And if I take the log of it, I obtain that I have plus alpha over to W transpose W. Okay, so this already looks a lot like the error that we heuristically decided to, to minimize. Uh, we see that we have a similar problem over here and we can actually write it precisely in this form by noting that uh, my beta parameter is bigger than zero, so I can divide this and that actually puts it in the right form. Okay, so we see that it is the same for the case. So it is the same uh, when lambda is alpha over beta. And now let's think again about what these alphas and betas meant. So this alpha was my uncertainty on the weights and beta was basically the precision of my model and it was inversely, inversely proportional to my measurement noise. So this means that if I take a large alpha, so when I take a large alpha, I have a high precision in my uh, prior. So I'm pretty sure, certain that my model is, uh, has uh, weights uh, centered around zero. So I'm pretty certain that my weights are going to be zero. And so if I let alpha to be very large, then I'm cranking up this lambda term over here and let this penalty dominate. So I really make sure that my model has low uh, W uh, values. But then the, the other way around, if I say, 
uh, my predictive distribution have a have a high precision, so a large beta value. Basically, I say I'm pretty sure that my model is correct. I do not assume much noise anymore. My model is correct. So my beta will start to dominate and push this lambda value uh, to zero. So that means this uh, regularization term will be pushed to zero, and then my data dominates. Okay, so that's a bit how we could think about uh, these parameters. Uh, the main point is here that we have a data term and a penalty term, and we have some parameter that balances the two, and it can be summarized with one uh, lambda value. Okay, so let's see what this actually does. So I'm considering the MS9 case, so this very flexible polynomial, and if I set lambda to zero, I'm basically doing uh, maximum likelihood optimization. Uh, so I'm just fitting the least squares uh, solution uh, to my data, and that gives me this a very flexible function, which probably doesn't generalize well. You can see that with, it doesn't match with the ground truth. Now, if I set lambda to larger values, and we're working here with a logarithmic scale, uh, so if I set lambda higher, then I see I'm suppressing these oscillations, I'm suppressing these large values, and actually see I obtain a very nice and smooth function. And now if I increase lambda more and more and more, then I'm suppressing more of these weights, so all my weights are pushed to zero and I end up really with a constant zero in the end. So that's what I see here. Right. So in, in the top case we have no regularization. At the bottom left I uh, suppress my weights just enough. And in this case, I actually have um, too much actually have too much regularization. Now let's again quantify what we're doing here. Let's, let's again quantify how well our models are performing under these uh, regularization constraints. So that's what we do over here. We're, we're varying uh, the lambda parameter. Um, so on the left hand side, lambda will be very low, so basically no regularization at all. And then on the right hand side, I have a lot of regularization. And then we see these interesting things happening again. First of all, on the left hand side, we see this huge gap between the train and test error. So this is a huge generalization gap. And this huge generalization gap implies that I'm overfitting. So basically this means I have a very flexible model that perfectly fits to the training data, um, but starts to fit also to the noise, noise and therefore it doesn't generalize well. Now on the other extreme, if I regularize a lot, I see that I have a very small regularization gap. So this is a good thing. So um, my train model generalizes well, uh, but it doesn't perform well. So basically on this side, my model is too constrained uh, and I'm actually dealing with underfitting here. And then we have this whole range over here. All these choices for lambda actually show to be uh, appropriate. So this is actually a range of reliable models. And I call them reliable because the generalization gap is small. So that means my um, training error is sort of representative of my test error. Uh, and it tells me that it generalizes well. Okay, so I decided to put a square over here. I decided to put a penalty that penalizes the square of these weights uh, because this suppresses uh, the weights and it prevents overfitting. We saw that it actually prevents overfitting. But still, it was this heuristic choice, though it coincided with a maximum a posterior approach, but still this was a choice that we made. We said, okay, let's just add this regularization penalty there. So why not uh, tweak it a bit further? Let's say instead of quadratically penalizing, I'm going to take my weights to the power Q. So it's a, it's a different type of regularization. Now you may be tempted to think, okay, sure, let's really crank up this Q. Let's make it very large such that we have a very strong penalty of these weights. Now this is, that is something that you certainly shouldn't do. I uh, should remember that this lambda parameter is the parameter that sort of um, manages the amount of regularization. If lambda is very large, then basically my penalty dominates. Um, and Q doesn't have this function, it more as a function of the type of regularization. 
And we will see that in the QS1 case, um, this, this type of regularization has the effect of sparsification. So it will lead to W, which are sparse. And with sparse, I mean that actually a lot of the, the, the weights will be pushed to zero. So they will be zero. And now there's a name for this type of regularization for the case where we say we take my weights to the power one. So we really only penalize the absolute value of the weights. So for Q is one, we obtain the lasso. So this is a regression method, um, which encourages, encourages sparsifications of my, my weights. Now let's try to think of why would this have a sparsification effect and let's compare it to the quadratic penalty. So if you take the square of a large number, it will become an even larger number, right? If I take the square of a small number, let's say 0 0.1, it will be 0 0.01, so it will be an even smaller number. So taking the square really emphasizes the differences in my weights. And then if I'm going to minimize this this regularization penalty, then I have most to gain by reducing the largest values, right? So uh, with such a quadratic term, the larger weights will get more uh, st more strongly penalized than the smaller weights. There's more to gain by reducing the larger values. But now if I take the Q as one case, the Q is one case, then I'm just looking at the absolute value. And if I'm then going to reduce this penalty term, I could subtract, subtract a little bit of well, the highest weight, but I could also subtract a little bit of the smallest weight. It doesn't matter. It contributes to the same improvement of my error. So also quite often the smaller values will be reduced. And this leads to the fact that actually the smaller values will quite likely or quite often will be pushed to zero. So this is a, a first interpretation of why this QS1 has this sparsification effect. And you see this really quite often in practice that people really like uh, the QS1 uh, let's say the L1 penalty because of this uh, sparsification effect. Now we can also approach this from a second angle, from a more geometric point of view, that also explains this uh, sparsification effect. And that, that's this figure here that comes from the book of Bishop uh, in chapter 3.4. So let, let's discuss this thing. Um, it, the basis of this observation of this geometric approach lies in the observation that minimizing this error function is equivalent to minimizing some constraint uh, uh, minimization problem. And this is discussed in detail in the book of Bishop in appendix E. Uh, but the, the idea behind this, suppose I have this constraint minimization problem. So I'm, for example, reducing, minimizing the sum of squared errors under the constraints that each individual weight to the power Q, like the sum of each individual weights to the power Q should be smaller than some particular value. So this is a hard constraint. My solution has to satisfy this constraint. And then you can use, a, use the method uh, of Lagrangian multiplier to turn this into this particular um, minimization problem. Now the point is then for such a minimization problem, for such an error, we can define a constraint uh, minimization problem. Uh, for each lab that we have a particular uh, eta that we can choose. Now, with that being said, we're going to minimize this energy function or this error function that's uh, indicated here with these isocontours where the optimal value is somewhere over here. And the solution, so the solution, so W has to satisfy this constraint and the area where W satisfies this constraint is indicated over here. So my solution for W lies within this disk of radius, which is proportional to eta. Now in the QS1 case, this region looks like this. Now, and we know from such constraint optimization problems that if the optimal value for W actually lies outside of, of this region, then the solution will be obtained at the border of this region of allowed uh, solutions. And in the quadratic case, it will be located over here. And in the uh, QS1 case, it will be located over here. Now, this is of course a particular example, but you can show that um, in this case, the solutions are really most likely to occur on these axes. And uh, maybe it's best illustrated in, let, let's zoom in a bit and move to a bit more extreme case. So this was the Q is two case. This is the Q is one case. And now let's see what happens in, let's say the Q is a half case. So this is my space of W parameters, W1, W2. And now I'm still minimizing 
this error function indicated with these uh, ISO contours. And now in the QSA health case, the region of allowed solutions looks something like this. So it becomes a bit more pointy. So and from this, of course, we get the feeling that indeed, um, well, uh, this region shrinks in this direction and we see that, uh, well, we're indeed most likely to obtain a solution right at these uh, pointy areas. Okay, so in summary, we have a penalty term that controls the size of the weights and thereby controls the complexity of the models. And with QS2, so a quadratic penalty, we actually obtain uh, maximum posterior estimates. And with QS1, uh, we obtain sparse solutions because we saw that those solutions are most likely to occur right at the axis, meaning that one of the other components has to be zero. Um, okay, so in theory, we could move all the way down to QS0 to really have a strong uh, sparsification uh, prior. Um, and in this case, QS0 means that a weight is either fully on or off. Uh, but this seriously complicates the mathematics and uh, associated implementations, whereas the QS1 case, so the Lesu case, is still nicely manageable. And in fact, uh, I want to end this video with an example that shows that this sparsification actually takes place and that it actually leads to a nice interpretability of, of the models. Now, this is an example from the Elements of Statistical Learning book. Um, where a predictive model is trained in the context of prostate cancer uh, analysis. Now here they want to predict the blood level of prostate cancer specific antigen. And they want to base this prediction on several measurements such as uh, cancer volume, uh, the weight of the prostate, uh, the age of the person, so several of these measurements. Now on the left hand side uh, a model is trained using ridge regression, so a quadratic penalty. And uh, then this model is trained for several values of lambda. And what they did in the book, they actually defined an effective degree of freedom associated with the lambda parameter, right? Because uh, a higher lambda parameter means a strong constraint and therefore it restricts uh, the effective degrees of freedom of the model. So going from right to left is actually an in in increase in lambda and this means a, a decrease in uh, effective degrees of freedom. Now this plot then shows uh, the weights obtained uh, via the model for different settings of lambda. And we see on the, if we go all the way to the right, this is a very low lambda parameter, so very little regularization. And then if we crank up the lambda value, then we see that all the weights get pushed to zero. So we see that this weight decay, which we wanted to see, is actually taking place. Now the authors they they checked which model generalized bad, best and that was indicated with these uh, red lines. Uh, so this is the most optimal uh, model. Now in the QS1 case we have a sparsification effect and that is beautifully illustrated here. So also here lambda runs from right to left. Um, so where on the right hand side we have no regularization at all and all the measurements get assigned some weight and then for large lambda value, the weights get pushed to zero, but not all of them decay equally quickly to, to zero. We see that some survive longer than others. And this is a really great, great way of figuring out which of my measurements are most predictive for my target. So the authors indicated here with this red uh, dashed line, uh, which model generalizes uh, best. And they, did, they tested it with an independent test set. So apparently this model uh, in this model, only three of the remaining weights survived and everything else is set to zero. So this means I can do a pretty accurate prediction with just uh, the cancer volume, um, the weight of the prostate and, and uh, some other measurements. And the other measurements such as age, well, I can easily do without it. So I can shrink it to zero and that's what's actually, actually happening. Okay, so lasso based regression automatically selects the most important features via the sparsity enforcing regularization term.